I'm Drew Stevenson, and this is a lecture for my administrative law course about the case Friends of the Earth v. Laidlaw, a United States Supreme Court case from the year 2000. And this case is about standing to sue, or the who has standing to sue, and the relationship between that concept in law and other doctrines like mootness and causation and redressability. Now, for my students, the basic ideas about standing or standing doctrine is pretty straightforward for law students. We have uh, injury in fact, causation and redressability. They probably learned this in constitutional law and you review it in administrative law. And we have some sort of a breakdown factors for injury in fact provided in the Lujan versus Defenders of Wildlife uh, case. That all sounds pretty simple, but in practice, when you actually get into court, standing gets messy very quickly. And this case is a great case for learning about how standing actually works and how complicated it can get and how it is a little confusing how it relates to other doctrines. So let's look at what happened in the Laidlaw case. So Laidlaw Environmental Services had a wastewater treatment plant in South Carolina, and they had a permit uh, for discharging water from the wastewater plant under the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System. Um, don't worry about this. It's all you need to know for this case, the NPDES permit. And this had been issued by the appropriate state environmental agency, and it was done under a federal law called the Clean Water Act. And this permit actually authorized Laidlaw to discharge water after they had treated it and removed all the pollutants into the North Tiger River. And there were a bunch of restrictions on that, as you might imagine. And I, in the picture here, I show the pipe of finished water that would have gone out to um, dump into the river. So at some point, this is actually a picture of the river. In this case, Laidlaw started discharging forbidden pollutants into the river and basically violating their permit limitations. And this included mercury, which is a highly toxic pollutant. And this was either a recurring or an ongoing event. Now, why did Laidlaw do this? Why would they uh, dump contaminated water into the river? It saved a lot of money. It's very expensive to have these pollutants uh, disposed of properly and legally by a hazmat removal company. And so it was just cheaper and helped their bottom line or their profit margin to dump in the river. Now, the Friends of the Earth is a conservation group, and the, their acronym or their name spells FOE, and they, along with some other conservation groups, decided to sue. So the first thing they had to do uh, procedurally was notify the South Carolina State Environmental Agency of their intent to file a citizen suit to stop Laidlaw from polluting the river. Now, the citizen suit provision in the federal statute, that's the Clean Water Act, requires the state agency to be given first dibs to bring the lawsuit, and then you have to give the agency 60 days to decide. And if they do decide to that they want to bring the suit against a polluter, it preempts any private citizen suits. On the other hand, if they say no thanks and they pass on it, then the citizens who want to sue can move forward with their claims basically kind of in the stead of or in the shoes of the, an environmental agency to stop the pollution. So here's what happened. I pulled a quote out from the case. On the last day before this 60-day waiting period expired, the state environmental agency simultaneously um, filed a claim and settled it at, at the same time with Laidlaw um, in exchange for Laidlaw paying $100,000 uh, in civil penalties and then kind of a mamby-pamby uh, promise to make every effort to comply with its permit obligations. So this uh, may sound like a lot of money, but compared to how much they were saving, this is kind of chump change for Laidlaw. They're, it's a cost of doing business. They're going to pay a fine and then make a sort of a half-hearted promise that they will try harder. But the fact that um, the state agency has brought a suit and and settled already would normally preempt other citizen suits about it. So Laidlaw then goes right back to polluting, um, at least from time to time. And eventually the Friends of the Earth decided to sue them anyways um, for their ongoing violations. And how much are we talking about in terms of Laidlaw's bottom line? They save more than a million dollars in hazmat removal costs by dumping into the river. And so when we get into federal district court this time, 
uh, uh, foe, the friends of the earth, makes their case of, look, $100,000 is nothing if they're coming out a million dollars ahead by polluting. So the district court decided to uh, ratchet that up to uh, 405000 and some change for the violations and said, you know, that's got to hurt. Um, that's a big setback for laid law to have to pay a fine of over $400,000. Um, and that should be adequate deterrence. They'll learn their lesson and <clears throat> for future violations. I hope you can see, though, that from Lane Law's standpoint, from a simple business calculation, they would still come out $600,000 ahead, uh, more or less, if they continue polluting, right? Because it's they're saving a million dollars and they only have to pay a $400,000 fine. The district court also refused to order any injunctive relief against Laidlaw, i.e. to stop polluting, because at that time, Laidlaw had stopped, at least temporarily, to make the case moot. In other words, Laidlaw shut down their facility while the case was pending, hoping to get the case dismissed on mootness grounds or thrown out, And but they, the facility was still there and could just reopen and start polluting again. So Foe appeals this decision and it goes to the Fourth Circuit and the Fourth Circuit held that they actually lacked standing to ask for additional penalties because laid loss penalties were being paid to the government and not to the Friends of the Earth. So this is an important wrinkle in this case and uh, a complicating factor for standing. Do you have standing to sue when you're harmed? but the penalty is gonna be paid to the government instead of to you, right? So normally when we present standing initially in law school, you sort of picture the plaintiff who's the one who is actually injured, who's trying to be made whole. <clears throat> but in some standing cases, we have someone who is suing and if it's a civil penalty, it might actually be paid to the state agency and not do really anything to, um, uh, to compensate the plaintiff for their, uh, the injuries that they've suffered. So it, let's look at this from Laidlaw's standpoint for a moment. In other words, Laidlaw argued that Foe's claims for injunctive relief were now moot, at least uh, while Laidlaw had stopped polluting. And at the same time, Laidlaw claimed that citizen groups like Foe lacked standing to seek civil penalties that could be paid to the government, not to the organization or its members, because that means we don't have redressability. How the theory goes, how could be, we be redressing the, um, the members' injuries if the money is being paid to, some, to someone else, to a third party like the state or the federal government? Now, this goes to the U.S. Supreme Court and late law loses. The majority held that the Friends of the Earth and other groups do have standing to bring a citizen suit seeking both injunctive relief and civil penalties. And they also held that the action was not rendered moot by late law's sudden compliance or temporary shutdown of its facility if violations were likely to recur and the majority thought they were. So, when we talk about standing, you'll notice in your case books in law school, a lot of the cases actually are about groups who want to have standing, not just an individual. Again, it's one thing to talk about standing when we talk about an individual plaintiff. That's kind of easy to get your head around. It gets more complicated very quickly when we talk about a group of people suing on and the group is suing on behalf of the um, interests of its members. And so here's the quote from the Supreme Court about associational standing, and this is a great quote to kind of keep in mind. An association has standing to bring suit on behalf of its members when its members would otherwise have standing to sue in their own right. And the interests at stake are germane to the organization's purpose, and neither the claim asserted nor the relief requested requires the participation of individual members in the lawsuit. You might want to take a moment or pause the video and look at that and see if you understand all the boxes that you have to check there in that one sentence to successfully assert associational standing to sue. Now, let's talk about the members of the Friends of the Earth. 
they actually had named some members of their organization who lived very close to the river and regularly fished there. So this wasn't something in the future or speculative that they might do someday. They had been fishing there and now they couldn't because the everybody knew the fish were contaminated with mercury. And so this satisfies injury. In fact, it is concrete and particularized. I would, would fish in the river near my house, and now all the fish are contaminated with um, the toxic mercury, levels of mercury. Now, Laidlaw had argued that the plaintiffs actually couldn't prove damage to the environment. In other words, they, they weren't bringing an argument that a certain number of fish had died from the mercury. And so since they weren't alleging the fish are dying, that they didn't have uh, standing to sue. But the court doesn't buy this. They say that, look, the, the members showed an injury to themselves. They don't have to show how much the fish have been hurt or how much the fish have died, right? So this is an important thing to understand about environmental cases and standing to sue in environmental cases is that we're often talking about the environment from the perspective of how it affects humans or us, not just how it affects the environment itself. But in any case, we satisfy the elements for standing here under Lujan versus Defenders of Wildlife. Here's a quote I pulled out. This is one of my favorite quotes from the case. Um, for those of you who like to highlight in your case books or things like that. For illegal conduct ongoing at the time of a suit, a sanction that effectively abates that conduct and prevents recurrence provides a form of redress. Civil penalties can fit that description insofar as they encourage defendants to discontinue current violations and deter future ones, they afford redress. In other words, one form of valid redress to satisfy the standing requirements would be to deter future violations. So the, in other words, the, the problem here is we're asking for a civil penalty for a past violation. But what we're really trying to do is have that be high enough to keep the violations, it disincentivize future wrongdoing or future injuries, not only by this party, Laidlaw, but by other potential polluters. And the Supreme Court here, this is one of the most significant parts of the holding in this case, says that a penalty that's not just making you whole um, for and compensating you for your past injuries, but is designed to disincentivize or deter future injuries can be a valid form of legal redress to satisfy the requirements of standing. Now, let's talk about mootness for a moment. A complicating factor in this case is the interplay between mootness and standing. You probably first learned about both of these around the same time in the semester in your constitutional law class, and there's a reason for that. The Supreme Court says that they're both grounded in the same clause in the Constitution. The Constitution's case or controversy limitation on federal judicial authority in Article 3, Section 2 underpins both our standing and our mootness jurisprudence. But the two inquiries differ in respects critical to the proper resolution of this case. So understand that uh, mootness and standing end up being kind of closely related because they're still, they're both kind of derived from the same clause in the Constitution, but they play out a little bit differently or we apply them in different ways, these two concepts. And the problem here is that de is a defendant who temporarily stops their wrongdoing, their injurious conduct, um, so that they can get a case declared moot and thrown out of court, and then they can go right back to what they were doing. And so a defendant's voluntary cessation of a challenged practice does not automatically make a case moot. Quote, if it did, the courts would be compelled to leave the defendant free to return to his old ways, the majority says. Note the burden shifting here. The burden of proof is on the party asserting mootness, which is almost always the defendant, to show clearly that the allegedly wrongful behavior could not reasonably be expected to recur. In other words, it's not uh, the burden is not on the plaintiff to show um, that it uh, will recur. The, if you're going to assert mootness to try to get a case thrown out, you have to claim not only show why it's moot now, but that it's going to stay moot. It's not going, you're not going to just go back to doing what you were doing. Now we have a characteristically scathing bombastic dissent from Justice Scalia that's worth reading. 
he seems to overstate what's going on in the case, the, the effects of this. But I pulled out one quote for you that uh, is actually helpful for law students, uh, sort of a point to review and make sure you understood what's really going on in this case. Uh, the, it's very subtle. A claim of particularized future injury, Scalia writes, has today been made the vehicle for pursuing generalized penalties for past violations. And a threshold showing of injury, in fact, has become a lever that will move the world. Well, forget about that last part. Look at the beginning of the sentence. And right, I, Scalia always, if he doesn't get it, didn't get his way in a case, it was the end of the world as we know it. But the note that he's he is zeroing in on something that is the issue in this case that we're talking about a future injury that's concrete and particularized enough to satisfy standing requirements, but then the redress, the judicial redress that or um, uh, uh, the co compensation we're asking for is uh, to um, to fine them for past violations in order to deter them from these future injuries. And that is a little weird, right? That's a, a confusing part of this case. And it's the part that he really doesn't like. Okay, that uh, concludes our lecture about uh, Friends of the Earth, the Laidlaw.